Thanks, Bob. <laughs> God is so good all the time. Get your Bibles out. Get your Bibles out. Turn to Matthew. And get your set if you got it. Matthew, chapter 13. God is so good to us. He's better to us than we are to Him. Come mm -hmm. on, somebody. Mm -hmm. That reckless love is a very powerful, powerful song. Because Jesus Christ, you could say if it was in worldly terms, He gambled it all for us, but it weren't a gamble. He knew what He was doing. Let that cross up from Sunday. That's where everybody knew their sins. I'm guilty through that cross. And some of those are doubled up. So there's a lot of a lot of, a lot of people who come up and lay their sins at the foot of the cross. Oh, my soul, I'm giving it to you. Amen? Amen. Y'all, that's all. Uh, when you get some rain seat for me, because I've actually got it up here too. This weekend, we can actually, I'm going to help you out. Oh, I'm going to turn it on, I'm not turning on. Praise God. I saw a move look at me doing like this. I'm thinking, are they saying I ain't got any sins? <laughs> then I saw two or three doing it. I said, I know I don't have any sins now. Amen. A pastor, y'all will stand up. A pastor had a former friend. That, look, see if this is you. A pastor had a former friend in his congregation. They were talking over the fence one day, and the pastor asked the farmer, Abe, if you had 100 horses, would you give me 50? Abe said, certainly. The pastor asked, if you had 100 cows, would you give me 50? Abe said, yes. Then the pastor asked, if you had two pigs, would you give me one? Abe said, no, cut that out, pastor. You know I've only got two pigs. <laughs> In other words, if I win the lottery, I'll get a church. 50% God. But I don't even give them what I got now. Uh -oh. Woo! That was a joke with, with, with some, with some uh, uh, hot Tabasco. What would call that? Was that hot sauce? Tabasco. Tabasco and another habanero. Amen. Amen. God, you know I only got two pigs. You want me to give you a pig? Amen. All right. Now, look, heart conditions. We're going to talk about heart conditions. I, I, I'm kind of messed up because I think this thing should be down another another notch down there. So I'm looking up here, way up here, and I'm thinking, something don't look right. It's because the thing is a little bit high side. But that's okay. We got this. Amen? Get your Bibles out. Matthew 13. Here we go. 13. I've already got it up here too. So we can look. If you don't have your Bible, you can read it here. There we hear the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, then the wicked one comes away and snatches away that which is sown in the heart. This is just a... The, 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 the explanation. I didn't just read the very beginning. I'm going to go ahead and just read the explanation. Then, then uh, he who received the word by the wayside, but he who received the seed on stony places is he that hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures only for a while. But when tribulation and persecution arises because of the word, immediately he stumbles. Now he who receives seed from among the, among the or sowed seeds or receives seed among the thorn, he is also who hears the word, and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of the riches choke the word, and he becomes unfruitful. But he who receives seed on the good ground is he who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and produces some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty, some have two pigs and give one to God. Amen. Father, I love you, Lord. I praise your name. I thank you for your grace and your mercy. I thank you, God, for all you do and all you say. I thank you, God, for the power of your word, the anointing that it possesses, Lord. I thank you, God, that we are not alone. We're never alone. You're always with us. There's things that happen in this life we do not understand. There's things that happen in this life that even crush us. But God, we know, Lord, you said that we might be crushed, but we're not going to be, be crushed under, but we're going to rise up. I ask you right now, Lord, to touch us, to, to, Make a difference in our life. In the name of Jesus, we pray. The church said, 
Amen. 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 You can be seated on the way down. Give somebody a high five, low five, no five. Tell them God is good. Amen. Amen. Now, now, how many, I'm asking a question. I'm going to get some medical stuff going on here. How many knows uh, the number one killer in America? <laughs> Besides the automobile. You know, matter of fact, I, 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 I'm going to start a petition because there's been in the last couple of days people have gone and run over crowds. Uh, terrorist attacks where people run over crowds with their cars. So I want to find out what make the car it is. And then go to the car company and have it taken out of off the market because cars kill people. Good idea. The point of the matter is you can take all the guns in the world away and they're still going to have guns coming at us. So number one. Number two, you take all the guns away and they'll still find a way to kill us. You can take the cars away. They'll find a way to kill us. It's time for us to wake up and realize it's not the instrument. It is the problems in the mind. Amen? And the spirit. We need God. We don't need that. We need God. Amen? Amen. 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 And until we get God in on this, we're going to keep on taking away cars and guns and whatever and people are still going to be killed. Amen? So, so here we go. Number one killer in America is heart disease. I'm glad y'all knew, well, most of them do it anyway. Heart disease, amen? Matter of fact, heart disease or heart conditions, actually, did you know that one in every four deaths in America is due to heart disease or heart conditions? That's a lot. One in every four deaths has got to do with hearts. Now, now I got a little better than that. Listen to this. The number one killer in the church. I mean, the number one killer in the church. I'm going to say, I know you can say, say, no, Satan's not the number one killer in the church. Did you know that? Complacent. Yeah. <laughs> Listen, Satan is not the number one killer in the church. You know what the number one killer in the church is? Spiritual heart disease. Because if your heart is right, he can attack and you can withstand it. Don't you know that Satan stands outside of every church in America right now and he's finding ways to infiltrate, finding ways <coughs> to come in and to destroy God's work. So it's not a matter of Satan. That's like taking the guns away and saying that people will no longer be killed because that attack cars running over people. That's not the problem. Satan is our number one enemy, but the number one killer in the church is not Satan. It's spiritual heart disease or heart condition. Now, now if you look up heart in the Greek, and you look it up in the Hebrew and the Chaldean and the Latin, whichever way you want to look it up, when you look up heart uh, in the Bible, <coughs> Excuse me. Here's what it is. Watch this. This is some powerful stuff. Number one, when you talk about a person's heart, this is a spiritual heart. We're not talking about the bumper. We're talking about the spiritual heart. The spiritual heart, number one, is your intellect. Amen? It's how you see things. It's how you process them. Sometimes when I see things, you know, sometimes I have to step back and sit back for a minute because when I see things, <clears throat> until I can process them correctly, I may move out of step or move away from God or move out of step with God. So it's very important that when something's coming at us, that when we see something coming, something's been dropped in our lap, whatever, stop, process it, give it a chance to sink in, and once it sinks in, once you get past the shock value of what's going on, then you can start moving in the right direction. So first, a spiritual heart is your intellect. Number two, not a spiritual heart is your intellect. A spiritual heart is your will. And when I talk about will, I'm talking about how you hang. You know, what kind of like, how you hang it, bro. You know what I'm saying? Our, our, the biggest uh, Spanish I've ever learned was, que pasa ese? What's happening, dude? How you hang it, dude? Well, you see, let me ask you a question. If I could, if y'all all spoke Spanish, I could ask you, que pasa ese? How you hang it? How you standing up under the pressure that you're under? Has the pressure that you're under pushed you back and pushed you down and pushed you away from God? Or has your will been strengthened because during all of this, you don't have spiritual heart failure, but instead you've let God process it through your spirit, and now you've got this, this intellect process, you've got what's going on, you're trying to bite it away, bite it, take a bite out of it, figure it out, then you have the will to keep on going, you're going to keep on standing. Then the third word for heart is emotions. Now, now, now this one here gets us in trouble more than anything. My emotions get me in trouble because these emotions actually are like reflexes. 
Have you ever had somebody hit your funny bone? Or hit your knee reflex? Or hit you somewhere in a reflex and without you even knowing it, you're going to kick them? Or, you know what the biggest thing is when I hit my funny bone? Everybody around me automatically laughs. It makes everybody else laugh. How about that? Have you seen that? You hit your funny bone and go, oh! And everybody starts laughing. They go, oh, did you hit your funny bone? I reckon I did because y'all were laughing. Your emotions sometimes can get away with you. And so because your emotions can get away with you, your emotions lie to you. The Bible says in Jeremiah that the heart is deceitful above all things. Meaning your emotions can get the best of you and cause you to make some stupid decisions. Cause you to step out when you should be stepping back. Or cause you to, to step back when you should be stepping forward. So you've got to pay attention. It's important that your intellect, you are processing what is happening around you. It's part of your heart. It's also important that you have the will to, to go on, the willpower to do what's got to be done. And then you've got to keep your emotions, how you respond, in check. Because emotions are the hardest part of the heart system to keep in check. And then finally, when you talk about a spiritual heart, you talk about courage. Courage is when you stand up knowing that you can be knocked down. You're still going to stand up. I think about that, 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 that person standing in front of us in China where the guy stood in front of that tank. Or, or seeing people that stood uh, 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 overseas in other different ways and stood no matter what. And even people here making stands, knowing that they may get knocked down, knowing they may get killed, but they still stand because they get a courage in them. So it's important in your heart, listen, if any one of these four parts of your heart is failing or flagging, guess what? you got problems coming. You've got a spiritual heart condition. So, so it's important that you keep your intellect in check, your will, your emotions, and your courage in check. I, I like what the Bible says. Uh, of course, the Bible is always awesome, no matter what. But I, just, I love what all the Bible says all, anywhere, but especially right now. He says in John 14, 27, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give you as the word gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled. I'm afraid. Again, heart, your intellect, your will, your emotion, your courage. Do not let those four things in your life get troubled, get stirred up, get shook up, get knocked out of balance. That's what it's talking about. When you get stirred, you get knocked out of balance. And when you get knocked out of balance, here it goes. You're not your intellect, you're not thinking clearly. Your will, you're not sure if you're going to keep on going or not. Your emotions, you don't even know how to respond. And then your courage, can you even keep standing up? So, so again, he said, let not your heart, those four things, let not your heart be troubled. And if we're troubled again, it means like, I just can't even think. And not let it be afraid, because I'm, I'm even stifled. I can't even move. I'm in such a, a fix here. So, so the cure for heart trouble. The cure for the spiritual heart condition is the Word. The Word inside out. Let me tell you something. The Bible says in the beginning was the what? The word. In the end, what will still be here? All things that were made were made by what? Who? The Word. The Word is not just the what. It's a who. The Word. The Word is so powerful. Go to the Word anytime you find yourself being troubled, when you find yourself being agitated, shook up, when you see your intellect, your will, your emotions, and your courage being put on trial. I love this here. It says, 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 I'm leaving you well and whole. This is my parting gift for you. Peace. I don't leave you the way you used to be left, feeling abandoned and bereft. So don't be upset. Don't be distraught. John 14 and 27. You see, God's word is powerful. Man, is it powerful. And I was thinking, well, I, I, how can you explain how powerful God's word is? I'm going to show you. Watch this. God's word, let's look at it in a different way. Let's go ahead and break this really, really down. The word of God is a seed. It must be planted. It must be cultivated. And then here's the parable. The seed is the word of God. And that's what we're talking about here. So watch this now. Watch. God's word is a powerful, powerful seed. 
Now, let's break it down even further here. It's a powerful seed in at least three ways. And watch this now. If you're taking notes, write this down because this here will actually make a difference in your life today and throughout this week. As a matter of fact, if you can really get this inside of you, this will make a difference in how you see and respond to things that happen to you all the time. So get ready. Number one. Come on here, buddy. Number one. It has life-giving power. John 6 and 63 says, My words are spirit and they're life. The second part of the three ways, it is it has fruit-bearing quality. Just one seed can produce a great harvest. We did it a few weeks ago. That one seed, how much could come from that one seed, 700 percent? And then watch this now. Watch, watch. And number three, it has to be planted and it has to be nourished. So, so it has life giving power. That's God's part. It has fruit bearing quality. Again, that's God's part. But it has to be planted and nourished. Now, this is our part. We have to humbly accept the word planted in us. And when it says humbly accept it, what it means is so many times we think we know how to handle the problems. Well, come on, y'all. I, I, when things get going wrong, when things get going to happen, I'll go try to help somebody, or, or I have my own little situation, and I have all these people willing to give me the answers. The only problem is they don't know the question. Don't shout me down. <laughs> There's so many people that are so willing to tell you how they would do it, but if they were actually, like the Indians said, don't, don't, don't judge me until you walk a mile out of my moccasins. If people were more empathetic, and instead of trying to give people advice, just give them the word. Just give them the word. You know, so many times I find myself now, look, so I said, what would you do, Pastor? And I go, no, no, no. I'm not tell you what I would do because I won't know how I'd handle the situation you're in. I'm going to tell you what the word says. And I'll tell them about the word. How many of you remember you've asked me to say, what should I do now? And, and how would you handle it? How many times have you heard me say, no, you don't want to know how I would handle it. I want to tell you what the Word says. Because the Word is where the power is. The Word is where the fruit is. The Word is where you multiply. The Word is where you grow. The Word is where it will help you stand up and take what you've got to take when it comes at you. Amen? So, 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 so humbly accept the Word planted in you, which can save you. You see, here's the hard part, planted in me. In order for it to be planted in me, I've got to, to partake of the Word. I've got to just partake of the Word, but I've got the Word, let the Word get deep, deep, deep down inside of me. So here we are. Now we're going to talk about these matters of the hearts now. Watch this now. Again, matters of the heart. The seed, watch this. The seed actually fell on four different types of soil. And when it talks about the four different types of soil, actually it's not just soil. But it's actually talking about a different heart condition. It's talking about a condition of your heart. Now, I want you to think about this today. I want you to watch this. I want you to think about it. I want you to actually ask God, ask the Holy Spirit right now. We're going to stop for just a second. I want you all to repeat after me. And mean it when you say it. Put your hands up. Usher's getting what our hands are up. <laughs> Don't even listen to me. Get it? Get it what our Put your hands up. Ready? Lord, Lord, Lord. I, surrender myself I surrender myself to your word today. To your word today. I, surrender myself I surrender myself to your spirit. To your spirit. Father, I ask you right now, Father, I ask you right now to, help me to help me see me, see me in, the mirror of your word. in the mirror of your word. Help me not to look to the left, help me not look to the left or the right, the right behind me or in front of me. Father, help me see me. Help me see me. In your mirror. Your mirror. Today. Today. Father, I accept, I accept the intervention, the intervention of, the of the Holy Spirit. The intrusion of the Holy Spirit the of the Holy into my life. Today. Today. In the name of Jesus we pray. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Okay, so now you can see these four heart conditions. And now that you've asked God to tell you and show you, He's going to show you which one of these you've got. And I'm here to tell you something. You may like it or you may not like it. Just remember, this is not me. This is God's Word. Amen? And it's not me. If you're convicted, it's not me convicting. It's the Holy Spirit convicting. 
If you're lifted up, it's not me lifting you up. It's the Holy Spirit lifting you up. But when you find this condition, if you're in one of these conditions, your job is to ask the Father how to change the direction. How to change my heart condition. So first, the very first thing we're going to see is going to be the unguarded heart. So here, planted on, planted on, the, on, the, on the wayside, and here comes the wild birds coming and taking away our seeds. It's the seed that's planted on the path. The path itself is so hard that it could not take root. Amen? You know, I, I, I know when the Bible says we are to plow up the fallow ground of our heart, it's talking about ground that has not been cultivated. It's talking about ground that at one time had been used to bring a harvest, but now it is just there. It is all just nothing but hard. It is not being worked. It is not being cultivated. It's not being prepared to receive seed. And so if you throw seed on, on fallow ground, what you're going to do is you're just going to throw seed on top of hard, rocky, dirt, roots, and grass. The path is so hard that the seed cannot take root. The birds of prey came and they took the seed. So I'm not going to be long today. Somebody I heard somebody say, yeah, all right. <laughs> what would you do if I told you I had one more slide? Right. Wouldn't believe it. You, uh, who said they wouldn't believe it? Okay, you're right. Ready? I didn't say it. I said, what if I said it? <laughs> all right, ready? Here we go. Here we go. When the Word of God is not accepted, Think about this now. How many times have you, you know, have you been been studying your word, studying your stuff? You go to college, and I'm going to college, and, and I'm sitting there studying, and while I'm studying, somebody starts texting me. And while they're texting me, all of a sudden, I'm just kind of breezing over something, breezing over my notes, and, and while they're texting me, I'm trying to answer about them, and I'm looking back, and I'm answering to them, or then I get a phone call, or, or, or Bethany, or, or, or Linda will start talking to me, and, and I just kind of breeze through, or sometimes even miss, I miss a whole paragraph or two and not even realize it. And so then, when it's test time, I've even said this. Where'd that come from? You ever said that? Where'd that come from? That wasn't even in my book. And then I go back and look, and guess what? It was there plain as day. The problem is, listen. The problem is it fell on a hard ground. Actually, never got a chance to take root because I was so busy doing other things. You can sit here in church today. And if all you, that's why I asked you to pray before I started talking. If all you can think about is things like, what am I going to have for dinner? Or, why did I fix that car yesterday? Now i got to fix it today. Or, who did I think they are? Look at that person sitting there. And you got it all in your mind. It's all playing back and forth. Satan is having a heyday. Your flesh is having a heyday. And I'm here talking, and all you see is this, actually. Yeah, you know what? That's the mind. But look, you know what it is? You ain't heard a word I said. Why? Because your heart is unguarded. Now, if this is happening to you at this very moment, stop right now and say, Lord, he just hit the nail on the head. Help me put the guard back up. Amen? Because it's so important. This could be your life in your hands right now. This work could be something you need today. It could be something you need tomorrow. It could be something you need in a couple of hours. You never know. But if you did, if it was put to you, but you didn't use it, just like me. I, I took a test last night. <laughs> I took the test. I said, why do you even ask that question? It's not even here. I went back over the notes. I had just studied, and it was right there, plain as day. But I was too busy talking to everybody else and everything that it was right there in front of me, and I didn't see it, and I missed it. I just want that to sink in for a minute. How much do we miss? Because it's given to us and our heart is unguarded and we don't even realize it. And there we are with the answer, but we don't even realize it. So when the word of God is not accepted, it can be taken away and needs to be sung. Again, that's why I come to church every Sunday. So I got to come to church every Sunday. I got this. No, you don't. 
I read the Word of God every day. I hope y'all do too. Guess what? Every day I realize I ain't got something else I've discovered is the more I learn, the more I realize I don't know. Matter of fact, somebody said, you really get smart now, aren't you? I, go, no, I feel like I'm really getting dumb. Because the more I learn, the more I realize I don't know. So, so it's important. Number two, unguarded heart. Number two, so y'all can kind of gauge this. Four, four hearts. There was one. Here's number two. All right here, now this, this one here. <laughs> yeah, I uh, see that. That's not a pair of lips. That's actually, uh, that's, that's a seed. <laughs> Just wanted y'all to know that before we get going. Here's the thing. Why has got a pair of, a pair of, of lips on the ground? Okay. That's, that's how somebody did after they got an airplane done. <laughs> actually, they got to kiss the ground. Okay, ready? The, the, the shallow heart. See, this is the seed on rocky places. Amen? Now, now, when you get to see those rocky places, that's when you know, over in, in, in Israel, uh, they're, they're, they had a lot of rocky places. Oh, there was, there was soil, but the problem was the soil was only a thin layer of soil, and it was under oh, just a thin layer of soil over a base of limestone. So in order to be an effective farmer, you had to dig down deep enough to understand where the limestone was and not plant where the limestone was because you would plant and it would come up quick. But guess what? The Bible says, I love this, the Bible says that, 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 that it's, the seed sprang up quickly, <coughs> but it showed a, an absence of a root system. It showed an absence of moisture. When I see somebody grow real, real fast in whatever we're doing, unless it's something where, where there's a talent, if there's a talent and somebody's moving it real fast, even then, I have to put the brakes on. You know, uh, DC and Daniel, when they first come up, they started playing. I remember, I remember one, one Sunday, DC said, Daniel, we're playing bass. He's been playing the drums, and Daniel started playing the drums, and Daniel couldn't even reach the foot pedal. Daniel playing the drums, playing, playing good. And so DC said, it's time we put the bass, Dad. And so I started teaching him the bass, and he said, Can I play? I said, I let him play, play at, at offering sometimes. And then I remember DC said, Daddy, I'm ready. And I knew how fast he learned. And so to keep him from getting ahead of himself, you're going to find this out now, son. I played it down. You remember playing some of it down? You know why I played it down? Now you get to hear the whole Paul Harvey and the rest of the story. Because I knew if I didn't, you'd get ahead of yourself. And that's what Satan would love to do. you get ahead of yourself, you're just as dangerous as you are if you get behind yourself. And so I hold it this. One day, one day, uh, that morning we had an awesome service, and, and it was that night service, and people were coming in, and I heard the piano player, and she was awesome, and she was playing, and I heard, heard the bass, and it sounded like me, and I said, oh, did somebody record this morning's service? And they said, no. I said, well, who's that playing that bass? They said, the one that looks just like you. I went, Oh. So I went up to him and said, as he said, you want me to get off of Stay on, son. Stay right there. But I knew, listen, spring up too quickly. Then he starts trusting in himself, not trusting in the spirit. And here we go. And so, so I see people, when I see people wherever doing what, I see them get too quick. It always gets me kind of nervous. And one of my models is if it grows too quickly or it grows quickly, it will not last. Because somehow the flesh gets in it and tears it up. But here it is, the shallow heart. You grow up quickly. Here, here's, the, here's the lesson here. This is number two. The lesson here. It says the shallow heart is spiritually unstable in times of testing. And here's how you know it. You've grown up so fast that you actually have not been proven and tried. And because you have not been proven and tried, when the trouble comes, when the persecution comes, when things really get rough, you don't have roots. And so you only last a short time because when things get tough, you'll find yourself falling away. Amen? I like to think about this one too. Superficial Christianity. Come on, brother. Superficial Christianity will not stand in times of testing. You can come here and have the right suit. You can have the right hairdo. You can have the right dress. You can say the right, you can speak Christianese. You can walk and talk and look like super saint. But if you've got a shallow heart, you're going down, and you're going to go down far. So, again, y'all be asking God about all these things as it comes. And here, here's been my hardest one. 
This is the one I have a problem with, but not necessarily for what it said, but I'm going to tell you what it is. Watch this. Matter of fact, probably most of you go, oh, yeah, we see this one. Ready? <laughs> what is that? Is that, the, is that the weed choking out the seed? Is that what it is? <laughs> well, I said, this, this is my biggest one. Here my big, I'm going to go ahead and tell you. If I had to say I had a problem with any one of these, this would be the one that I had the biggest problem with. You have to forgive me. I, I have a sinus infection and an us respiratory infection. And I actually, I thought about if there was a, if there, I'm going to get a little gross now, but if there was a, uh, I need to send snot all over the world. You can bring me bottles and we'd be rich. Amen. Now, here we go. The cluttered heart. The cluttered heart. We live in an age of, <coughs> of super duper waffle whoop people. We've all got so many things we got to get done, and we all try to take care of too many things at one time. You know, and, and, and a lot of us are wearing multiple hats. And I remember a fountain, there was, there was a, a safety engineer, there was an environmental engineer, and then there was an uh, industrial engineering engineer. Well, one guy got quit, and the other guy, well, the other one got quit, and the other one got quitted. The safety and environmental. One got quit, one quit, and the other one got quitted. And OSHA found out. And Usher came on site to check some things, and they wanted to talk to the safety manager. And so they didn't want to tell them that we just fired him, and we haven't replaced him yet. So they called me. I go up to the front, and I said, you don't need me, you need the safety manager. I said, just come up here. And I opened up the door, and there's all these people from Usher with cameras. It looked like I was coming into a presidential thing. And they said, this is David Lynn. He's our safety manager. <laughs> then there's a knock on the door. The environmental people come up. <coughs> I get another call. What can I do for you? This is David Linton, <laughs> our environmental director. It sounds cool, it worked. My fight was aggravating because now I had many jobs, I had many hats. The problem was I had all these hats but only had one head. They found out recently, psychologically, listen to me carefully, how many like to multitask? Let me change that. How many have to multitask? But I'm going to tell you something that's going to be, it might, it might make you feel bad, but it's the truth. When a person multitasks, especially if, it's a, if it is a strenuous multitask where you actually, actually got to think about things, not just, not just like loosely putting the candy in the wrapper as it goes by the conveyor belt. I mean, you're actually having to think. When a person multitasks, just regular multitasking actually temporarily temporarily reduces your IQ by 10 points. That's not me talking. That's a psychological fact. You ever think why you're multitasking? Well, well, I, I forgot about that. I forgot about this. And, well, I should have done better than that. Why? Because actually to multitask removes, starts at 10% or 10 points and works its way down. So when you multitask next time, just remember that multitasking is can also lead to a cluttered heart. Also, cluttered heart is seed among thorns. Now, now, I want you to watch this now. This, this, I'm going to move through. I really am. Thorns first appear, let's think about something. Thorns first appear on the earth after the fall. So when I think about thorns, I always think about the curse. Amen? When I think about the thorns, I think about what? The crown of thorns. Where was those crown of thorns? On head. Where is Satan trying to get you at? None. So that's the 
cluttered heart. So, so, so watch this now. Look, look, look. Now, now the Bible tells us also not only just multitasking, like in this, this day and time, we got so much going on, just that kind of multitasking, but it also talks about another one. I want you to watch this now. This is very important. I want you to watch this. The Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter 6 and 8, there's, there's three more kinds of uh, multitasking or, or three more kinds of thorns that come to us that can choke us. The worries of life, the deceitfulness of riches, and the desire for other things. They all kind of play together. How many got things in your life that actually can make you worry? Amen? How many ever thought if I could just reach this rung on the ladder, things would be all right? You know, I remember, I remember I was at Fountain, I was working hourly. And I know the times they would, they would shut the plant down and say, now, if you got vacation, you can get paid. But if you don't have vacation, you don't get paid. And, and of course, God always blessed me because I worked in a place where they never gave me, gave me time off. Amen. I mean, they didn't even let me take my vacation half the time. And so I remember those days. But there was others that, 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 that when they didn't have vacation, then they were just, when the plant shut down for a week, they were just out of money. And I thought about that thing, and although I was still working during all this time, and it was only like the first year I was there, I said, Lord, it would sure be nice if I could be on salary. Because salary folks get paid whether they're there or not. I was working 40, 50 hours, usually around 50. I was on salary. I was getting paid hourly, making it decent. And so I get this promotion to management. And they said, now you're going to be on salary. I said to myself, cool. Now, if I have to plant shuts down, I'm going to get paid anyway. And now, if they pull some of these stuff, I'm going to get paid. And, you know, it's going to be okay. I don't worry about, worry about notches in my, my, money, my money situation. But I forgot about the notches in my time situation. Because I went from 40 to 50 hours a week. And DC will testify for me to 60 to 70 hours. If I work 40 to 50 hours a week, I got a nice raise, a really nice raise. But you work 70 hours a week, weren't so cool. So you know what? It was deceitful. So I've told my boys since then, don't ever go on salary, boys. Ever. You stay as far as you can on hourly. Do not go on salary because they will work you to death. I remember coming through, one of the people at the fountain were going to get married at the, at, at the Outer Banks. And so they wanted me to come through on Saturday. And, and, the, and the big man said, I want all the salary people to work at least eight hours on Saturday, no matter what. I came in that morning and worked for a couple hours. He come by and saw me. I said, where are you going, David? I said, I got a wedding. One of our guys here. You know what I'm talking about. You know he's getting married. Uh, I got to go down there to the Outer Banks. So it's going to be an hour, two-hour drive to get to him to marry him. He said, when you come back, make sure you pull the rest of your hours. <laughs> I was deceived. Yeah, he was all deceived. You know, I, I no longer cared about that anymore. As a matter of fact, I got to the point where, where, where I, I despised the way they were handling the salary and working you to death. Deceitfulness of riches. And then the desire for other things. Wow. We always think we get, somebody's got it better than us. We always think somebody's got it. They got it made. They've got it. They've got it. They've got it. Well, I can tell you, out of anybody I've ever seen, I've never seen one person yet, not one, not one, when they were honest with me, I've never seen one person that had it made, not one. I've seen people that had more than others, but I haven't seen one person that had it made. And I've also seen no matter how much you think a person's got it, how much you think they got it going on, they all got problems. And they all got, listen, matter of fact, what I found out is the more you got, the more problems you have. Sometimes God blesses you by giving you a subtraction. Amen? Amen. Here's the lesson. I'm getting close to the end here. Somebody say amen. I just want to stop the clutter in the heart, okay? If you get trapped in life's windmill, it just produces an anxious, think about it, an anxious Deceive Christianity. I'm on the treadmill. I got to have it. I got to do this. I got to do that. I remember the internship program. DC and Daniel, little bitty things. And I remember going to Greenwood Church of God. And I remember old Sundays. I just used Sundays to catch up because we had to read so much during the week. And there might be 10 chapters in one of these books a 
attend chat. We had we had four books to read a month, and plus the Bible we read the Bible through, and we had so many chapters in the Bible per night, and we had all this other stuff to do, and so you know, I was working swing shift, and it was so hard to get everything done. Then sometimes on Sunday I'd read all day. Sunday just try to catch up. Saturday and Sunday I'd read to catch up. And we got to agree with Church of God. And while I was there, we had Sunday morning service after Sunday morning service. And I remember, I was thinking, look. I was looking, I said, I said you know what? And then, I'll go ahead and tell you. I said, well, you know what, Brother Hayson? He can give him some rest. He's not working sweet as he is. He can give him a little rest there. So, Lord, maybe if I can get like that, maybe I can get a little bit of rest to work with me today. I'm being honest, candid with you. Start an internship program. We could get something to eat. After we get something to eat, I'd come back, put the boys down for a nap, and I would read and study or do testing or whatever from the time I ate till service time that night. After service time that night, I would go home and I would read till I fell asleep. And I would do. And I'd get calls up, Brother Hayes would say, Brother Lynn, what you doing tomorrow? I'm working. What about my time? What about my shift you on? I'm on second. Why did you hear at 8 o'clock in the morning? Brother Hayson, I got to go to work at 3, so that's why I want you here at 8 in the morning. I said, Brother Hayson, did you realize? He said, did you hear me? He said, are you serious about this or not? Yes, I am. Then be here at 8 o'clock in the morning. I remember the time I made a, 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 a 87 on one of my tests. I come in and he said, what you do? how you do your test? I've been making it in the 90s. And you're tested for the whole month on one weekend. And there being tested, I come to service that morning. I'm dragging my base up. I'm trying to get it ready. The boys are hollering and screaming. I'm trying to get them right. I'm trying to get everything going. And, I, and I've been sick that week. And I worked overtime. I think I worked 12 hour shifts. And, and I was trying to read everything. And I had to take time off to go to my seminar. And my own expense, pay for, pay for a night in the hotel room so I could be at the two day seminar that all the interns had to go to once a month. And I get there. And I had to drive two hours to get to it. When I get there, I take the test. And, and when I start taking the test, it's on the Bible and all, all those four books that I read. And I made 87, which is not bad. And Brother Hastings said, how'd you do? I said, 87. He said, I don't want to ever hear that again. I said, excuse me, Brother Hastings. He said, do you plan on being a pastor? I said, yes, sir. So I told you he was tough. Y'all think he's all sweet when he come up here. And he said, he said, don't you ever make below 90 again. Do you understand? I said, yes, sir, Brother Hastings. He says, do what it takes. The ministry's hard. Be real. And so you know what? I learned quickly all this. I have even though I learned it. I still fight it. How about y'all? Get on the treadmill, you get running, and you get all things going on, and you're thinking, man, if I can just get this or this, if I can just move this direction, or if I can just retain this, things will be better. And you get to that, and you find out it's not better, it's worse. So watch. The cluttered heart. Anybody find yourself yet? Don't raise your hand. And do not point. And then find me. In this week. The receptive heart. That's where I try to stay all the time. That's where I try my best to be at. I've had people say, I've had people tell me, say, you know, God, some things don't bother you. And I'm going, yeah, things bother me. They get to me. They get to me a lot. But I've learned to have a receptive heart. You see, I take God's seed and let it fall in good soil. You've got a chance to work. Do you know that a lot of your problems, God will go ahead and solve them if you quit trying to fix them? I guarantee you, the people that put all these up here, if you could see spirits of what happened when they left, they come here and pulled it and carried it back. Carried it back. Because they're trying to fix it. If people just got the way that God worked, same word. The good heart is one who hears the word, accepts it, and produces the crop. Here, here's a lesson. I'm closing. 
I mean it this time. Now this isn't working, so maybe I'm just going to keep on preaching this time. There it is. Here's the lesson. Hearing the word is predicated on our desire to act on what God reveals to us. A genuine change of heart is seen by its fruit. <clears throat> Don't quote me the word of God if you're not going to I can't help but I got to use this. DC, we were practicing the other day, DC said, I know he was talking to me. Although he was trying to be good to Dad. He was talking to me. Go ahead and smile because I know you were. Because I'm the bass player. If I messed up, everybody messes it up. He said, Y'all played this a hundred times. Y'all can't get it. You played it a hundred times before. And all of a sudden it hit me. I said, Well, son, I preached some of the same words to you a hundred times or more. <laughs> Remember that they said? All of a sudden, the conversation stopped. This is uh, pickling too much. I won't, I'm not trying to pick on you, son. I'm just using that. was just too good to leave steel. <laughs> I love my kids. I tell you what, there's nothing I wouldn't do for them. That's a fact. They know that. So, so here we go. So here we go. The genuine heart. Is seen by its fruits. Here it is. Lisa, come on up here. Proverbs 4.23. It says, guard your heart. Listen carefully. Because everything you do. BJ, come on up here. Come on up. Guard your heart. Because everything you do flows from it. 